Morning, Brant. Am I on? We're good? Am I on? Awesome. It's weird with microphones and stuff like that, because normally, like, I'll be, am I on? Am I on? Okay. We're good. Oh, I, what's funny is I'm loud enough to where I probably don't need one, which is awesome. Praise God. It's just how he wired me. So we should, be, we should pray first. We'll be in the book of Nehemiah like we've been. We're getting close to the end, gang. I'm super excited. I'm super excited to go into Ephesians here in a couple weeks. Uh, it's one of my favorite books in the New Testament. So let me go ahead. Let me pray first. We'll begin. We'll recap where we've been and where we're going. So Lord Jesus, we thank you that all of Scripture is about you. Lord, all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is about you revealing your glory and your story, Lord, for your glory and for our good. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we look at the text of Nehemiah this morning. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we look at the jobs of the Levites and the priests and the things going on in this text and how they ultimately, Lord, point to you as our high priest who is sympathetic with us. Lord, I pray that you would be with me as I preach. Hide me behind the cross so that your people hear your word. Lord, it's in your good name we pray and ask. Amen. So, like in our typical Sunday morning way we do things around here, let's recap where we've been. For those of you that are just joining us this morning, even those of you joining online. So, Nehemiah. So, God burdens this man, Nehemiah, to go to the great city of Jerusalem to rebuild it. He gets, a, uh, he gets a report from his brother, Hananiah, we find this out in chapter one, that the walls have been destroyed. Through providence, through God's gracious hand on him, as he goes to the king, as he asks for resources, God gives him those resources. So Nehemiah comes, rallies the people, he builds the wall. God brings them through. This is not just, okay, cool, it's a construction project. He goes down there, he builds it. God brings provision through the problems that occur through men that would come to show up and hurt the work of God. Men like Sanballat and Tobiah, who are the main antagonists of this, of this book. The wall gets finished through many dangers, toils, and snares. They finish this massive construction project that the walls, just for those of you that don't know, the walls were 12 feet high and 8 feet thick with mud brick and hand tools. Like, I was working on a car yesterday with hand tools and stuff like that. I'm like, this is not nearly, I mean, ratchet and stuff like that. I'm like, this is not nearly as bad as moving dirt like Nehemiah and those guys did but all with hand tools. It was God working through them to do that. The people, so once they finish the, the wall, the law of God gets read. The people of God, the church of God, hears the word of God, and it cuts them to the heart. It cuts them to the heart. It exposes who God is. They repent. Uh, they commit to obedience. They commit that God, is, we're going to follow the Lord our God. And then last week, we seen that the leaders were named and they were trying to figure out who was going to stay in the city of Jerusalem, who was not going to stay in the city of Jerusalem. They cast lots to do that. And here we are in the naming of another group of leaders within the book of Nehemiah. Go with me to chapter 12 in your Bibles. We're going to be reading the priests and the Levites. I'll give you more context here once we get through this. We're going to be in the first 26 verses. I apologize in advance. I practiced these Hebrew names in the mirror six times. I've ate my Wheaties. I've done everything I know to do. I mean, it's weird. It's like mental amnesia. I practice. It's good. Game face. We're going to do this. I get up here. I see the names. I'm like, huh? Okay. But God is gracious. So let's go ahead. Let's read. We'll start in verse 12, we're going to verse 26, and we're going to see all of these names of the Levites and the priests. These are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shital, with Jeshua, Sadak, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amaroth, Mathula, Haftush, uh, Shikaina, Reham, Mermoth, Edo, Genetoi, Abijah, Mijam, Mahadia, Balga, Shima, Jororib, Jedediah, Salu, Omak, Hilakiah, Jedediah, and these were the chiefs of the priests of their brothers in the day of Jeshua. And the Levites, Jeshua, Benaiah, Chaldamiah, Sherebiah, 
Judah and Mattatiah, who with his brothers in charge of the songs of thanksgiving, and Belbakai and Unai and this and their brothers stood opposite them in service. And Jeshua was the father of Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim the father of Elishabim, and Elishabim the father of Jedodiadai, and Jodiadai the father of Jonathan, and Jonathan the father of Jedoadai. And the days of Jehoiakim were the priests, the head of the fathers of Shariah, and Merariah, and Jeremiah, and Hananiah of Ezra, and Meshelam, and Aramach, and Jehoahan of Meleliamum, and Jonathan of Sherebiam, and Joseph of Heriam and Edei, Meriamoth, uh, Helkiah of Edo, Zachariah of Gideonoth, Meshelamum of Abinjai, and Zachariah of Miniamamum, and Modiadiah, Pelatha of Begal, Shamiamai of Shemataiah, Jehoatham of Jorium, of Maniatani of Jedediah, Uzziah of Shalialai, Kilialai, Armach, Eber of Hilakayim, Hashbiabai, or Hashbiabai of Jedediah, of Nathaniel, in the days of Eliashabim, Jacodiadai, Jehoniai, just. Jedidiah, the Levites were recorded at the heads of the father's house, were two, so were the priests of the reign of Darius, the Persian. As for the sons of Levi, their heads of the fathers were written in the books of the Chronicles until the days of Jehoahem, the son of Elashibim. And the chiefs of the Levites, Hashbiabai, Shariabai, Je- uh, Jeshua, the son of Kimel, with his brothers who stood opposite them to praise and give thanks according to the commandment of David, the man of God. Watch by watch, Maniatiah, Bekaibam, Obadiah, Meshelium, Talman, Akubai were gatekeepers standing guard in the storehouses of the gates. These were the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Jeshu, the son of Jacodiadak, in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and Ezra, the, pri- the priest, and the scribe. That's a mouthful, y'all. I'm just going to p- pause for a minute because my tongue is numb at this point for reading these names. And be honest with you, I hope I'm getting better. I really do. <laughs> Someone's like, no, no, you're not. So... <laughs> So let me explain what is going on here because this sounds like, in other passages, like the phone book. Bunch of names we can't pronounce of people that are things that are going on. Let me give you some context to what's going on in this passage so that we might treasure the text of Scripture more. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we see in the first portion of this, in chapter 12, verse 1, these were the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel. Right? So the big question is, who is Zerubbabel? Just to give you guys a little bit of history beyond this. So there were many waves of exiles as they were coming back. It wasn't just when Nehemiah showed up, everyone got in the car. They didn't have cars back then. So everyone got in the camel, and we all just kind of rode to Jerusalem. It wasn't that. There were waves. These books of history happen in context. So there's much stuff going on. So Zerubbabel, there were two massive waves of exiles that came from Babylon to Israel, back. One was with Zerubbabel, there was a smaller one with Ezra, and then Nehemiah. So Zerubbabel, them going back here is going all the way back to the beginning when God started bringing his people back to the land. That's what's going on here. So there's multiple waves. And what's very interesting, to be totally honest with you, remember how I said God... Uh, burdened Nehemiah's heart with him hearing from his brother in chapter 1, Hananiah, about the state of Jerusalem. This wave of exiles was probably what prompted him in the first place to ask that question. So him hearing about what God was doing in Jerusalem burdened his heart to go to the king to ask, right? So we got a little bit more context to see what's going on here. And note, too, 
about why they're mentioning the Levites and the priests. I have to mention this because this makes sense. It's like starting in the middle of a story and not having the beginning portion. You're like, I have no idea what's going on. I watched the first Lord of the Rings that way. Had no, I got to the battle scene. I'm like, I don't know what's going on, pal. I, I just see a bunch of arrows and it's cool. And I had no idea what came before it. In any of the context, I was like, that dude looks like an elf and he's shooting a bow. And what the heck is that thing? Like, I had, no, I had no idea what was going on. Let me give you a little bit of background about the Old Testament and about the society of Israel, why they would mention the people like the priests and the Levites. The Old Testament society was structured around the word of God, right? Everything. God dictated everything to them in their society. They were functionally something known as a theocracy. Basically, God was supposed to be their king. This is something that is usually lost on Western society, right? Because we compartmentalize our faith in Christ, at least in modern Western society, where it has almost no impact anywhere else. And brothers and sisters, that's a problem. Like, compartmentalizing your walk with Jesus is a very big issue. Your walk with Jesus to be totally honest with you, should impact every aspect of your life. It should impact your career. It should impact the society you live in. We should be working toward, we, we preach the gospel of Jesus, of Christ crucified to everyone who will listen. And then we structure society, or we try to structure society, so that it reflects biblical morality, biblical things, because that's where the full human flourishing comes from. Amen? Amen. So that's what was going on in the Old Testament. That's the reason why they're bringing up priests. They, they structured their entire society around this thing called the Mosaic Law, right? The first five books of the Bible are something known as the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five, or the Law of Moses. Does that make sense? You guys trekking along? Just making sure everyone's on the bus with me. We're good. So the Mosaic Law just to give you like a brief Sparks Notes version, which is how I got through 10th grade English class, Sparks Notes. Praise God for those people. Here's how this works. The Mosaic Law was broken down into different categories, right? So all the first five books. So there are different types of law within the first five books. There's the ceremonial law, your cleanliness before God, your righteousness before God. For example, like dietary laws. They weren't allowed to eat certain things like shellfish or bacon, which makes me cry. Like, <laughs> like the, the cleanliness laws, ceremonial, civil laws. God dictated civil laws to the people of Israel. They were, like, you had to have a, a parapet around your, around your house, like a, a fencing. So if somebody came across and they fell off, that's a, that's a civil law. That's part of the law of Moses. Like if you didn't do that and someone got up on your roof and fell off and died, it was life for life. Like it was a big deal. Like there was civil law there. And then there is the moral law of Israel. Like the moral law, it's a second table of the Ten Commandments. It's concerning God's holiness. And just a brief side thing as I explain the law, this piece carries over to us as Christians. God's moral law gets reflected in his church so that we follow things like do not murder. I mean, every law is theoretically like moral, <laughs> if you think about it. Like every law, like every law, other than like paper filing things, every law is based on some form of morality. It's just a question of whose. That's a side note. But the point is the other two laws of civil and ceremony were fulfilled in Christ. And the church follows the moral workings of God. This is important to know because... This explains why we're naming off priests. The priests were massively influential in administering the law of God, the word of God, to the people of God, right? So we have to know what's going on here or else this looks like a bunch of Hebrew names that Pastor John can't pronounce and it looks like the phone book. This is what's going on, brothers and sisters. The Levites and the priests were critical they played a critical role in the nation of Israel and their society. Like, you don't know, like, this doesn't make sense if you don't know how their society was, was structured. So one of the reasons why the priests and the Levites are listed is because they played a massive role 
They played a massive role here. So I want to ask a question. If we're thinking about the massive role of the people of Israel, what was the role of the priests and the Levites? What was the role of the priests and the Levites? So the overarching thing of what the priests and the Levites did was they were help the people of God worship God. Right? Make sense? Kind of makes sense. So they were... They're basically the paid staff of the Old Testament that help people encounter God. Like, per how God wanted to be worshipped in his word. Let me say that again. They were there to help the people of God worship God how God wanted to be worshipped in his word. That is massive, brothers and sisters. So much of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, which I just referred, the first five books of Moses, reference how God in that time period wanted to be worshipped, right? Here's a side note that goes along with this. This is something that we, the within the Reformed community, we would call the regulative principle of worship. This is something very kind of important in, uh, in thinking about worship. Have you ever noticed... Who here, who here's read some of the Old Testament? Some, maybe Bibles, like class, something like that. You ever wonder why everything is so specific? You must take, for a sin offering, I'll just give you an example. You must take a ram, a one-year-old ram, or an ooh, a, a, a baby lamb. It must be without spot, without blemish. It is terrifyingly specific about what you must do. You ever notice that? You're like, that's really weird. That's, that's really weird. You wanted that, like, very specific how God wanted to be worshipped. And I'll, th- I'll throw this out here. It is very dangerous to worship God apart from how he has prescribed us to worship him. I want that to sink in, brothers and sisters. Do you know there were men in the Old Testament, like the sons of Aaron, for example, a man by the name of Nadab and Abihu. You ever heard of them? So here's what happens with Nadab and Abihu. The sons of Aaron, the people of Israel, go hear the law of God. They come back. They've set up Aaron as the priest. Nadab and Abihu come and offer false fire before the Lord and literally fire engulfs them because they offered it improperly. They did not do it per his prescription. Like, it was dangerous. Uh, King Uzziah, another guy in the book of Kings, uh, he was struck with leprosy because he didn't worship God according to his commandments. Like, he had t- the king was not supposed to offer, wor- offer the censer, the, the burning thing before the Lord, and God struck him with leprosy. Sometimes it doesn't work out. We, we don't just get to approach God willy-nilly, to be honest with you. We get to boldly come in Christ, but we don't get to just worship God however we feel like. I want that to be set through because this is absolutely mission critical. God gets to dictate how he is worshipped, right? God gets to dictate how he is worshipped. Because, because why? Because he's God. He gets to do that. That's his job. That's who he is. Because he's glorious. And I want, to, I want to illustrate this too. Especially when we're reading genealogies of people. Especially Levites and the priests. Look at me. God preserved for the people his means by which he prescribed for himself to be worshipped. Guys, tracking with me on that? So the people of Israel got taken into captivity in Babylon and all the different tribes and stuff like that. God preserves the worshipping class of people, the Levites, the priests, so that his people can worship him. God makes a way when there is no way. Amen? So that's absolutely important, especially when we're reading this, that God is keeping the priests and Levites so they can minister to him. Now, here's a good question. What, when we're looking at what they did, right? So let's break them down into the Levites, what they did, what the, the both of them did, and then what the priests did, because this is important. Levites were musicians in the temple. One of the jobs that the Levites did, if we look at uh, verse 22, 8, look with me. And the Levites, Jeshua, Benani, let's scroll down. 
with his brothers were in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. This is the worship team, guys. This is, the, this is the singing team where they lead the people of God to sing the songs of the people of God. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that we actually have a song book in the Bible? Do you guys know where that's at? The book of Psalms. The book of Psalms was the hymn book of the Old Testament. I actually would love to sing Psalms around here sometimes too. That'd be awesome. Because that's what they, that was their song book. Men like Asaph, You guys ever heard of him in the Old Testament? That was his job. He was to write music before the Lord and to sing praises and thanksgiving for who God is and what God has done, right? That was one of their jobs. So they were were to sing the Psalms. Funny thing, there's actually churches that still do that. I said we should sing the songs. I know in the Reformed community, they have this thing called the Trinity Psalter. You guys can find it on Amazon. It's super cool. It actually puts the Psalms to music. So if you're ever interested in that, check that out because it's awesome. Another thing, they did set up and tear down of things like the tabernacle. So before Israel came into the land, when God, um, when God set Israel free from bondage in Egypt, right? You guys ever see the Prince of Egypt? I know it's not the fully most accurate biblical like cartoon that they show people. That's supposed to be funny. (laughs) But God rescues Israel from captivity. Well, they didn't possess the land for quite a while, so their worship was set up in something called the tabernacle or tent of meaning, right? They would move around. They'd take the, put the thing down, take the thing up. It's like a giant tent. Like one of the responsibilities of Levites were who was taking what, who was moving what, where, how things were to be handled. God is very specific in how he is to be worshipped. Very important here. There's actually a story, believe it or not, I said earlier that the King uh, Uzziah and the Nadab and Abihu, there's another story that perplexed me to death when I read it for the first time. You guys ever heard a dude named Uzzah? Uzzah in 2 Samuel 6, 6 to 7. So David is going to go get the Ark of the Covenant that's been taken away by the Philistines and it's causing them all kinds of problems. So they put the Ark on a cart, right? Uzzah is standing there and steadies the Ark and God strikes him dead. I'm like, why did God strike him dead? It's kind of rough. Well, he assumed that his hands were cleaner than the, the dirt, to quote Dr. R.C. Sproul. But also... God was very specific in how the ark was to be transported. It was supposed to have gold rails put on. They would hold it, and the Levites would move that. In the book of Numbers, chapter 4, there's listed three different, uh, three different people, three different people groups, three different types of Levites. The Kohathites were in charge of caring for the objects associated with the sanctuary. In Numbers 4, 14, or four, Numbers 4, four, uh, 4 to 14, They had the Ark of the Covenant, the Table of Showbread, and other holy items they were responsible for moving. The Gershonites, they took care of the decorations of the sanctuary, curtains, ropes, coverings, things like that. The Meriathites uh, maintained with carrying from place to place pillars, basins, frames, pegs, cords, things that were created in the, the sanctuary. These guys were like the Old Testament roadies. You guys ever said like, like a band is the band is setting up? They got people that move stuff. That's what these guys were doing. God was very, very specific on who was able to move what. So like when you read the story of Uzzah who steadied the cart, you're like, whoa, whoa, stop, dude. You didn't do it the way God prescribed. That's why the dude died. Very interesting how that how that went down. So the the Levites were there to move things, help out, and assist in worship. So the other question is, what were they both instructed to do? So in the previous chapter, in the previous one of the chapters we see in the book of Nehemiah, we see them set up in the the book of Nehemiah, set up this giant platform where Ezra the priest reads the law of God. He reads the law of God to the people of God, and it cuts them to the heart. Very interesting thing, too. While Ezra is reading the law of God to the people of God, the Levites are standing in the bottom explaining 
the law of God. It's not just the word of God going out so we just, we hear it, but we need to explain sometimes too. So we understand. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we, uh, one of the things that they were in charge to do is they were to read the law of God, to teach the law of God to people. And this cuts the people of Israel to the heart. Why? Because the law of God, the holiness standards of God, expose who we are. It exposes our sin nature. It's like the symptoms of a disease. I said a while back, I got COVID way back in October. I knew, the nurse practitioner knew I needed to go to the, go get the COVID test where they stick the roto-rooter halfway up and look at your brain stem. That was horrible, by the way. Like, because I told them my symptoms. I couldn't smell anything. I couldn't smell Vicks Vapor Rub or vanilla. I'm like, I can smell a bottle of Vicks probably being opened at the store that way from here. Like, it was bad. My wife looks at me, she goes, that's, I told her, I was like, babe, I can't smell Vicks. She's like, that's not good. That's not, like, but that's how they knew my symptoms. They, they knew what I had based on my symptoms. That's what the law of God does. It exposes symptomatically our sin, and that cuts the people to the heart, because God is ultimately holy. And if we're sinners before a holy, righteous God, we deserve judgment. We deserve not his grace and his mercy, mercy, but his wrath. We deserve punishment. Like, that's what the law of God does. The law of God exposes the holiness of God. And let me just be honest here for a second. Much of what's missing in evangelicalism is the holiness of God. What's missed? And I was doing this research this week. It's missed because men like me, pastors, don't preach the word of God. They don't preach the word of God. And it's... it's, it's horrifying because most people are biblically illiterate in evangelicalism let me just be honest that's the truth i'm just gonna level with you guys most people in evangelicalism we have 26 bibles but we've read none of them we don't know what is contained in this book we don't know how to think biblically as Christians. We don't know what, what God requires of us. We don't know that a broken heart and a contrite spirit and those things, we don't know. Because we, we don't know the word, and if people do know the word, they don't care. Because people, like pastors, don't get up and say, this is the word of God. We're encountering the very creator of the universe today, brothers and sisters. There really is a heaven. There really is a hell. And there really are people not going to heaven because they've not repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus. They're really going to experience the wrath of God in eternal conscious torment in hell. I hope that's none of us here today, brothers and sisters. I hope today would be the day if you don't know Christ, you'd repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. Amen? Because here's the real thing. What I said with pastors in preaching, the, one of the reasons why I go through books of the Bible, right? We're going through Nehemiah. A couple of weeks, we're going through Ephesians. The reason why I do that is so that we can hear the Word of God. I think there is something, I've said this before and I'll say this a billion times, there is something glorious about reading the Word of God to the people of God, even when there's funny Hebrew names in there. It's true. There is something glorious about hearing the word of God. Now, that's one of the reasons why I do it. I preach systematic three through books of the Bible because I'm trying to expose people to the text. I try to give as much backstory to the text of Scripture as humanly possible. The reason why we're talking about the Levites and what they did in their job description was be, so that we can understand why this is important and why this is in the text of the Bible. Now, to be honest, I don't have like cool names for sermons. I don't have like seven steps to a better you. I've got Ephesians and Nehemiah. That's what I've got. That's all I got. <laughs> like, it's the truth. You don't need more than that. The average worship service, just to give you guys in uh, 
just to give you guys pretty much where we're at in evangelicalism, the average worship service is nothing more than emotional hype, a TED Talk sermons of seven steps to a better you. It is what Christian Smith in his book, uh, 2005, called Therapeutic Moralistic Deism. It's nothing more than a self-help book. When that's just tragic because we need the word of God. And this impacts how we think as Christians. This impacts. People without the word of God, we, we buy into the world's philosophies, side note here, that people are basically good. We buy into something called secular humanism, that people are basically good people when scripture teaches that people are basically sinful people. Like, there's no such thing as a good person. I know I just offended like some people in here. You're not a good person. I'm not a good person. I'm a person in need of a savior. I'm a person in need of Jesus. <laughs> like, that's the thing. And here's the byproduct of this bad theology preached from the pulpit. The byproduct of the people of God not having the word of God applied to them. Like, not even knowing. Here's what biblical ignorance brings us. Um, and this is the reason why I want you guys to get this so bad. It gives us bad anthropology. Anthropology is the study of man, right? You guys know anthropo anthropology? Like, study of man. We don't see man for who man really is. We think man is just like, uh, we, we think we're not sinners. And that's the problem with, with things going on today. It's reflected in how we share the gospel. Think about that how people, the average evangelical church shares the gospel. Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life. And if you just submit yourself to Jesus and we'll get some guy up here with a guitar and just strum a little bit and emotionally manipulate, your life will be better. No, when you come to Christ, you come to die to yourself. And you come to, you come because it's the glory, it's the most glorious thing ever when we come to Jesus. It is because he, we, we repent of our sins and trust in him. That road is hard some days, brothers and sisters. Just to give you a side note, it reflects and we give a man-centered gospel of how you can tack Jesus on and we don't give a God-centered gospel, which the gospel is always God-centered. The God is a story about, uh, the gospel is a story about what God did for his people. Ultimately, the glory of the gospel is not for us, it's for God. We just benefit from it. Amen? Now, in many circles, this brings, so we got bad anthropology, bad evangelism, bad worship. We don't have reverence for God. We don't have reverence for the holiness of God. I want that just to sink in, brothers and sisters, because God's overarching, I said this before, God's overarching quality is his holiness. Holiness is God is set apart categorically and is different than everything in creation. This is his overarching characteristic. Like if you're boiling down what God is and attributes of God, holy. God is holy. And let me be honest with you. The holiness of God, right? The word of God cuts through the hearts to the people of God. And the word, his holiness, explains one thing to us. We need a mediator between us and God. Holiness, we need, left alone, we're done for, right? The holiness of God experience, it shows that we need a mediator. That's where the priests come in in the Old Testament. That's the foreshadowing of Jesus. The priests in the Old Testament were a mediator between God and men. They would offer the sacrifices. So part of the Old Testament sacrificial system, you would bring a lamb, like I said a few moments ago, you would bring a lamb without spot, without blemish, to the priest, they would kill it and apply the blood in your place and for your sins. Do you guys see the foreshadowing of Jesus there? Like all of these things foreshadowed you. The Old Testament priests were a foreshadowing of the work Jesus would do on behalf of his people. So the entire book of Hebrews is about this. I actually want to go through the book of Hebrews one day just to go through, just to preach through it. I should put it on the preaching calendar because the entire book shows that Jesus is better than what's going on in the Old Testament. Like, we, we see the priests and the Levites. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. This is how the book breaks down. So what I want to do is I want to ask the question, 
when our time is our time period here. How is Jesus better than the priesthood? We've seen the priesthood. We've seen all this stuff here. And let me say this. Jesus is our mediator, right? In the Old Testament, you needed a mediator. You needed to go to the priest. In the New Testament, Jesus is our mediator. Brothers and friends, you still need a mediator. But in and of yourself, you're not, you can't come to God. And I don't care what our Catholic friends say. The only mediator between God and men is Christ Jesus. You don't need a priest to go to. You need to go to Christ. who We can boldly go to Christ. This is what Hebrews 4.14 says. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we did not... For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but, but one who is in every respect, every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in him, find grace to help in times of need. In times of need, brothers and sisters, we can go to our mediator, who is Christ Jesus. We have a great high priest, those we've seen here in Hebrews, that is able to sympathize with us because he was tempted in every way. This is better than the priesthood. Now, just a few things to go through. How Jesus is better, you can see this on the slide. Jesus is without fault. The offerings of Jesus was better than the offerings of the priest. And Jesus is a mediator of a better covenant of the new covenant. Let's look at these texts together, brothers and sisters. So here's the thing. Let's look at the first portion of Hebrews. The big thing of the Old Testament, the, where, where the Old Testament priests were lacking, was they were sinners. They were sinners exactly like you, exactly like me, that needed to atone for their sin and needed to atone for the sins of the people. Right? Let's read Hebrews uh, 9, 1 to 7. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship. Huh, we see that. In the earthly place of holiness, for a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, That was what God fed them in the Old Testament during the time of them being in the wilderness. And Aaron's staff that had budded and the tables of the covenant, the actual tables of the Ten Commandments, which God wrote with his finger, were in the Ark of the Covenant. Above it were cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot cannot now speak in detail. Hone in on verse 6 in the end. These preparations have thus been made. The priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second, only the high priest goes, but only once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. The high priests, even the most holy people in the Old Testament were still sinners, saved by grace. Those men had to atone for their own sins before they would go on the the Day of Atonement, which they're talking about here, something known as Yom Kippur, which is they would go, they would kill, uh, they would kill a sacrifice, they would go only once a year into the holy place and offer blood before the ark. Only one time per year, God was veiled to them. Actual intimacy with God, which we, as we've seen before, we can have, brothers and sisters, with Jesus, that veil is torn in the New Testament. We see that in John's gospel. We can boldly go to God, whereas they couldn't. He was a sinner, had to atone for his own sins and then the sins of the people. Jesus doesn't have to. Jesus is a perfect sacrifice. Jesus, he, w- he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He is a better priest. He's a better high priest. And the other thing too, these high priests, you guys see all the names we literally just read? These high priests would die. These high priests were like, they had an expiration date stamped on them. These guys, like they were not eternal. 
They, they had to, like, think about this. The first high, you guys know who the, first, the Bible trivia time, you know who the first high priest was? Aaron, right? Moses' brother. How many people from the time of Aaron to the time of even just Caiaphas in the New Testament, the guy who was high priest during when Jesus walked around, how many priests were there? A lot. One guy and the next guy and the next guy and then this guy would die and the next guy would take over. Jesus is eternal, brothers and sisters. There's not going to be another high priest. There's only one. His name is Jesus. He's eternal. He, you won't have... A, here's the weird thing, too. This is like the same thing with like election cycles. You ever notice that? Like every four years, we kind of freak out. There is no, ele- there is no election for God. God is God and we, no one's running against him. Trust me. No one's running against Jesus with high priests. He's never going to lose that office. We're never going to have another one. He's only going to be the he's one, Jesus. Now look with me. The offering of Jesus was vastly superior than that of the Old Testament priests. The offering of Jesus was better. Look with me in Hebrews 9, 11 to 14. But then Christ appeared as high priest of a good thing that has come. Then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? I just want to feel the weight of that. The blood of bulls and goats. So those of you that are not familiar with the Old Testament, let me just go over this one more time. What they would do, they would take an animal, a lamb, a bull, they would kill that animal, and then they would offer that animal to God. It's like a, it's a perpetual bloodbath in the Old Testament. Blood everywhere. Blood. Hebrews 9.22 says, without, without bloodshed there is no remission of sin. The people of God knew that they, the people in the Old Testament knew that lamb should be me. I sin before God. This lamb is my substitute. Substitutionary atonement. The rock of Christianity. That Jesus lived the life we could not lead. Died the death we should die. In our place and for our sins. He substituted his own blood for mine. For the in the sacrificial system, it wasn't by the blood of goats or bulls or calves or any of that, but by the very blood of the Son of God who was holy without sin. Jesus never sinned, didn't deserve any of that, came from heaven where they they cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is. Isaiah paints this picture of angels flying around the tomb or or flying around the throne in Isaiah 6 with wings are covering their face, wings are covering their feet, and with two they're flying around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The train of his robe fills the temple. He came from that to here where they shouted, not holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, but what they shout, crucify him. Why? For his glory and for our good. For his glory and our good. To live the life we could not lead. To die the death we deserve to die in our place and for our sins. His own blood. The sacrifice was better. The sacrifice was better. It wasn't bulls, goats, calves, any of that. It was the very Son of God. His sacrifice, as we see here, is eternal. Your sins are covered past, present, and future, brothers and sisters. Let me explain something real quick. Something known as justification and sanctification. I think we get this wrong in evangelicalism. You are justified, brothers and sisters, one time. When you come forward, when you repent of your sins and you trust in Christ, this is the reason why guys like me herald the gospel the way we do. We want people to be justified with God. We want people to repent of their sins. 
repenting from your sins and trusting in Christ. That's how we come to faith in the gospel of Jesus, right? Amen? Amen. Good, we're all trekking along. You're justified one time. When you come to faith, one time, you're justified. Now, as you walk a Christian life, you become more sanctified. You read the Bible. You, your, your moral code changes. The sin gets purged from your life, and you're more sanctified. You're more like Jesus, right? Those of you that walk with Jesus for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, you're more like Christ. Those of us that have walked with Jesus for 10, 12, we're more like Christ than the day we first started. Those of you that have just came to faith in Christ, you will be more like Jesus, the more you walk with Jesus, much like walking a path. You guys ever see? So when I was in college, I had to walk this, I had to go from one lot to the other lot to get to class. They didn't pave some of those lots. They didn't pave some of those paths. So there was this, I, I remember when they put one lot over on one side. It was Mayhew, and I had to go to Prairie Herald over at Eastern. So I would park, I would get out, I would walk around. And when they first built this lot, you could see the path slowly develop. You ever see that, like, like game trails or something? Many people are walking it. Many people are walking it. It starts a little bit, and then walks a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And that was just a giant dirt path. They eventually paved it. Like, they eventually completed it. But the thing is, when the path start, first started out, there wasn't much to it. That's the thing with us in Christianity. The more we walk, we develop the path. Does that make sense? We become more like Jesus. Amen? Like, his sacrifice is eternal. Unlike the, so we're past, present, future. Like, here's the other thing too with the eternal sacrifice. It is the sacrifice once for all. Once for all. Like, the thing with bulls and goats, you would have to keep doing it, right? You would have, you'd, you would sin, you would bring an animal, you'd kill it, you'd go home, you'd sin again, you bring it back. It's like paying interest on a credit card. You're there forever. You just pay the just side note, y'all paying on credit cards, get to the principal if you can. Because you'll be there forever just paying interest payments. You'll never pay it off. Same thing with our sin. Jesus came once for all and delivered our, delivered our sins. There is no more sacrifices. There is no more sacrifices to make us holy, to make us like God. There's only one. Right? I want you to see that his offering is much better. Like, they don't, we don't have to continue to offer stuff, but we offer the very, Jesus offered himself in our place and for our sins. Amen? Amen. Now, Jesus is a mediator of a better covenant. Jesus is a mediator of a better covenant. Let's look at Hebrews 9.15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who call on him may receive the promised eternal inheritance since the, a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. We have a new covenant, brothers and sisters. Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the, curse of the law. The law, like I said, the law exposes who we are. The law of God exposes, much like I've heard this analogy before, like, my mom, the, the thing that, that God used to take my mom home that, that ultimately took her life was cancer. And I've heard this analogy before from a man that had cancer. I remember the, the x-ray that they took, the, the chest x-ray they took of my mom. And you could see the cancer, the, the, the tumor on near the portion of where it was. That x-ray did nothing to fix the cancer. All it did was expose it. The law of God exposes sin in our life. It's like the x-ray. Christ coming in the new covenant is the treatment which cures that disease. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I know many of you were sitting here saying, wow, that's a lot of info. We went to both books, the New Testament. That's a lot of verses and all the other stuff. Let me give you some, a little bit of application here. Let me give you a little bit of application if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, let today be the day of salvation. Let today be the day you repent of your sins. You turn from death to life. You repent. I know it's not a word we use much in common discourse. It, literally, it's from the Greek word metanoiate, the change of mind. Turn away from, you turn, you're, you're looking at sin, you 
turn toward Jesus. You turn toward the cross. You make a commitment to follow him and trust him. Maybe you're here today for that. Maybe you're here today and you're, you're a Christian, you've been walking faithfully and you're going through some hard things in your life. Every one of us are going through hard things, brothers and sisters. <laughs> I've had cars break in the past few weeks. Things have been rough <laughs> in the past couple weeks. But God is good. God is gracious to us and God is merciful to us. Trust in Jesus. Preach the gospel to yourself like we read in Hebrews 4 earlier on. We have a sympathetic high priest who was able to sympathize with us, who was tempted in every way. So we can boldly come before the throne of grace. Come before the throne of grace. Maybe that's what you need in your soul. Recommitment. Come, come to the throne of grace. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you in ways that only he can. Remember, brothers and sisters, we have a great high priest. All of the Old Testament, all the whole Bible points to Jesus. It's all about him. Let me go ahead and let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us at the cross. You're our great high priest who loves us. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us, that we would trust you more. And Lord, we would uh, be busy with the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.